Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's really nice uh, that some of you are interested in Ricketts Glen State Park birds, and uh, I'm going to be also talking a bit about the North Mountain in general, and also about some a little bit about boreal forest bird research in the state. First question we would have would be, uh, how do I get this to go ahead? Um, So if you have your PowerPoint okay. slides up, you should be able to just why is, advance why is, slide. Why is Ricketts Glen Park important for birds? First of all, it's a really big park. It has over 13,000 acres in Luzerne, Sullivan, Columbia counties. It's really the gateway to the big woods of Northern Pennsylvania. It's a big forest block that includes game lands 13, 57, 66, comprising over 115,000 acres, the largest forest block in northeastern Pennsylvania. It's a diverse forest, mostly mixed age forest, and it has elevations ranging from about 1,200 to almost 2,500 feet. And it also has extensive mature forest with little edge, little human disturbance for large blocks of even in the state park. It supports high numbers of breeding bird, forest interior birds, many headwater streams, and boreal forest and supports several species of special concern and species of greatest conservation need. There's a, a map of the state park and you'll notice it's really an excellent map. DCNR does a great job with the state park maps. They're underused by the public. And uh, without going into all the details here, it shows several hiking trails in the park. The Falls Trail is only one of the, of the trails. Uh, and as you see by the map, over 90% of the park is forested and, and adjacent to it are two brown blocks and they are game lands 13 and 57. So that makes it much more valuable. You have access to those parks, uh, state game lands through the park. Here's a list of uh, some of the, tra the trails in the park, 95% uh, of the hiking done in the park is done on the Falls Trail and the good birding is on the other trails. Uh, there are several trails, most of which are flat, not on a, on a grade. So they make for easy birding, easy walking. And uh, many of these trails are very accessible and the map makes it very easy to find these trails. I spend most of my time birding in the park on all the other trails besides the Falls Trail. There is a long history to this park that is often unknown because it's mostly people outside the area that have studied the birds in on North Mountain. The, one of the first of which was the great Jonathan Dwight, who said in 1892 in a paper he wrote, on North Mountain, the forest is truly primeval. The hemlock, the yellow birch, and the maple are the characteristic trees and attain great size. Much of it was virgin forest at that point. Hemlocks are scattered with considerable numbers throughout the forest and tower above it. They're huge trunks, often four or five feet in diameter, marking them out as giants among their lesser brethren. The underbrush is often dense and everywhere great logs covered with green moss, the moldering. Here and there you can hear cold brooks that seem to imitate the song of the winter wren that's almost constantly heard among them. The drawling song, the drawling song of the black-footed blue warbler is heard on every hand, high up in the hemlocks, the drowsy song of the black-footed green warbler is heard, and the lively chatter of the black burning warbler catch the ear. Is this not a bit of northern Maine? Here it was that for the first time I heard the wood thrush, the hermit, and the olive backed. That's our Swainsons, all singing at the same time. The three species were abundant, and the music at sundown was a concert for which sweetness would be hard to excel. They don't write like that anymore, do they? Another gray ornithologist that visited the area was Whitmer Stone from Philadelphia, who's better known for studying birds at Cape May. But he came up to visit North Mountain at the invitation of Otto and Herman Baer, who are, were important naturalists of the day, and they live near Lopez. Skip Conant uh, is related to the Baer brothers. Another important person that's often uh, not known is a, a very fine woman ecologist whose name was Theodora Morris. Who's, who was known by her friends as Teddy. She later married and her name was Teddy Cope. 
She wrote her PhD thesis, and please remember this is 1936, a woman writing a PH ecology th PhD thesis, observations of the vertebrate ecology of some Pennsylvania virgin woods forests. And one of those four forests were Ricketts Glen and Ganoga Lake. She went on later to, to write some wonderful uh, nature books. A big leap in Pennsylvania ornithology were the two, the first and then the second breeding bird atlas. And we studied a lot of the birds in this North Mountain and learned a lot about the distribution of these Northern and Boreal forest birds during the first was, and then the second uh, breeding bird atlas. And I made a connection then that will that lasted me the rest of my life. And that was to Roger Skip Conant from the Philadelphia area. Skip had long, had long connections to North Mountain, particularly Dutch Mountain, which is north of Ricketts Glen. And he and I did a lot of birding together and uh, worked on their, uh, several projects together. He, here's a picture of he and I at Eagles Mirror uh, looking for a Merlin nesting there, which are still, which the Merlins are still nesting at Eagles Mirror. But anyway, he contributed a lot and was one of the top volunteers, both at Ricketts Glen, World's End, and other parks, and con contributed a great deal during his life. Unfortunately, Skip has passed, and, but it's left many friends behind. I'm now volunteering at the Ricketts Glen State Park four years after um, retiring from the Game Commission. I lead uh, bird walks. I've led over 30 or 40 bird walks the last four years there. And uh, we also we do other programs, and I conduct a lot of bird surveys in the park and also volunteer for the Game Commission by doing surveys in uh, the game lands. We have several projects going on as part of this overall approach, and one of them is just public education. Uh, this is a remote area. It's, it's, fam it's famous and attracts a lot of people to walk the Falls Trail or go canoeing at Lake Jean, but uh, a lot of people don't know about the wildlife of North Mountain and Ricketts Glen. So we try to teach anybody about that. Uh, we've done a lot of social media outreach, our, the Facebook page. I continue with the Pennsylvania Boreal Forest Bird Project. You you all know, most of you know about my yellow belly flock catcher research, collect data on bird populations in the park. And we've, I've, I've contributed several hundred, uh, a few hundred eBird records. I do BBS routes and also contribute to Pennsylvania natural heritage. We plan to uh, publish an annotated checklist and uh, a guide book on, uh, for, the, for the park. But meanwhile, we're collecting a lot of data we're hoping that this serves as a model to other state parks. I'm oh, goodness, if you can do it at Ricketts Glen, you can do it almost anywhere. Uh, we do this Facebook page. I know it has limited distribution, but I get a lot of positive feedback for all the bird, the bird photographs and also about uh, talking about bird locations and habitats, conservation issues that face the birds of the park and, and North Mountain. So let's go down some of the, the, rare, the birds of the park. I'm gonna try to do this uh, somewhat by habitat. Now, Ricketts Glen it may be known for forests, but it's also headwaters uh, for many major uh, trout streams in Pennsylvania, this being Kitchen Creek, but also Fishing Creek, Bowman's Creek, Bohoopany Creek all originate at or in or near the park. Uh, one of the most common birds is the, uh, the wood duck, uh, water birds, and it's a uh, secretive breeding ground, uh, hard to find in the park, mostly at Lake Jean at the edge and adjacent game lands. A more common, a uh, bit more common species is the common merganser, and it, they do nest along some of the streams in the park, uh, as well as the major trout streams uh, in and near, uh, in and near uh, North Mountain. This has been a big change in populations in the last 50 years. Uh, these mergansers are responding to the higher water, water quality. There's also hooded mergansers and they nest mostly in still water. Uh, they can be more difficult to find. They're more common in the game lands where they nest on, on the different waterfowl ponds. Great blue heron nesting colonies uh, near the park and visit the park often. These are uh, most often um, observed by canoeists and kayakers at the park. Uh, they're interesting to watch and I've seen them kill muskrats and mice at the edge of the park as well as fish and frogs. A Pennsylvania endangered species nests 
uh, near the park, some years as the American bittern, and we occasionally find it in migration at the park. Uh, it's known for its loud pumping calls, uh, and it's one, you know, one of the species that you look for and we hope nest, but they seem to be pretty irregular in their use at different breeding locations. Another species that people really enjoy by kayaking or canoeing are the belted kingfishers. They're found along the edge of the park, the edge of uh, uh, Lake Jean, but also you can find them by walking the falls trail. And they, they forage along Kitchen Creek, Bowman's Creek, and the other streams in the area. Spotted sandpipers are a rare nester. They can be found along uh, the shores of Lake Jean and any local streams. This species probably suffers due to uh, the increase in uh, drought conditions and then flooding conditions in the park. One of the big thrills of the park for many people is, is are seeing their first bald eagle. Bald eagles do not nest at the park. Uh, they do nest uh, not far from the park in swamps and lakes. And they visit the park pretty regularly, often to be seen on the south shore of the lake on this dead snag in the lower right part of the, the slide here. Um, and uh, one of the, a lot of people see the first bald eagle there. Acadian flycatchers are associated with the high quality streams at North Mountain. They're found mostly along Kitchen Creek, uh, mostly in the head, hemlock shaded stretches. They also can be found along South Bowman's Creek and, uh, and, and different tributaries of Fishing Creek and nearby game lanes. This is a fun bird to show to beginning bird watchers because we locate it first by its loud pizza song and then get to show each other the elusive uh, Acadian flycatcher. One of the real stars of the park are the Louisiana water thrushes. This is because there's so many high quality headwater streams in the park. And it's a fairly common bird along Kitchen Creek and Bowman's Creek and any of the trout streams. We call it the feathered trout, as you know. And, and uh, there is a really good indicator of high, high quality streams. So it's found pretty commonly. Uh, and you, We've even been able to find Louisiana water thrush nests on our bird walks. Of course, we're very careful. I took this picture at a distance and uh, this particular bird that I'm showing you now did not flush when we were watching it and successfully uh, raised a brood. Uh, other birds that use these, these tip-ups uh, along, along uh, these hiking trails in the old growth forest are Eastern Phoebe, a winter wren, Carolina wren, dark-eyed junco. So these tip-ups are really important for a lot of nesting birds in the forest. Another bird that's associated with wetlands is the swamp sparrow. There's lots of fun and we get to teach people the song of the, the swamp sparrow, which sounds like a chipping sparrow with wet lips. And it's easily found mostly in blueberry thickets and wetlands. Just to change the subject a little bit, one of the one of the animals, the creatures of the park is the river otter. And if you get there in early in the morning at Lake Jean or some of the other uh, bodies of water, you can see river otters uh, at Lake Jean. Uh, they often swim around before the people get out and uh, they're lots of fun to watch sometimes in small family groups. And, uh, it's, it's a real good feature uh, in, the, in the area to go out at night. You can hear them playing around in the stream together. There are only a few meadows, shrublands, and grasslands in the park uh, and nearby, and, mo and all of these are, are artificial. This is, these are the hay fields, as you see. It's near the Job Corps Center. This is really Colonel Ricketts' old farm that was, that was farmed actively in about 1895 to 1910 or 15, and uh, it's just a recovering old farm land. It's mostly a blueberry thicket with some wetlands, great birding. You can find northern, northern harriers on the mountain. They nest in and around wetlands and grasslands, bogs. They're kind of irregular. It's hard to predict where they're going to be each year, but we do have a small population of harriers on the mountain. Uh, American woodcock are found around Ricketts Glen and the, the state park and the game lands. They are nesting species. They primarily are found uh, at, the, at the hay fields, but we've even seen them at the edges of Lake Jean and walking across the grassy areas by the, the dam. Uh, and you can hear them in courtship in March and April at the park. 
Uh, it's an underappreciated bird of the mountain. People are looking for other game birds. And instead, uh, the woodcock is really one of the featured birds of the park. And uh, the Game Commission is, is really, ma is, uh, really uh, managing for woodcock habitat on the mountain. A lot of those timbered areas uh, on game lands 13 and 57 benefit woodcock, especially where they have wet soils. A very a fairly common lo locally, uh, locally found bird is the alder flycatcher. Uh, alder flycatchers are found throughout blueberry thickets and wetlands of Ricketts Glen State Park and the game lands. In fact, they're pretty common in uh, newly timbered areas of game lands 13 and 57. It's one of the first birds you hear when you go into a parking lot of game lands and roll down your window. It's one of the first things you hear in the summer is the song uh, Fabeo of, a, of an alder flycatcher or the, uh, the flat pep call. And right now they're wandering around uh, very tightly in family groups. And uh, you mostly hear them more than see them, but occasionally you get a good look at one like this. Uh, this and it's a featured bird when we take walks at the hayfields. Many people have seen their first alder flycatcher in the hayfields of Ricketts Glen State Park. Uh, I'd just like to mention that willow flycatchers, on the other hand, are rare and only occasionally found. They're found at lower elevations than uh, Alder flycatcher for the most part. Eastern bluebird is one of the another featured birds. Uh, they nest in old apple trees. There's lots of old orchards on North Mountain, and then you can find eastern bluebirds nesting in these old apple trees. And of course, there's there's a, a, a nest box program at the state park, and bluebirds nest on bo in boxes, including even a kestrel box or wood duck box occasionally. And uh, so people really enjoy seeing bluebirds there. It's not the kind of bird you think about when you think about a big forest park, but they are present. They're also found in some big swamps. Tree swallows also nest in the park thanks to the, uh, the box program, but they also nest in, in dead trees uh, in swamps on the mountain. House wrens are common and double, at least double brooded. Here's one uh, singing on top of a box in the hay fields. And uh, it's just it's one of three wren species that nest in the park, but they're found almost exclusively uh, in boxes. But they also will nest in old apple trees. So keep an eye out for that on the mountain. You'll find them in all kinds of odd places uh, uh, back in timbered areas because they take advantage of old dead trees. The yellow warbler is one of the most common uh, most popular birds we show on our bird walks. The males are just absolutely brilliant. The song is very easy to teach to people, the sweet, sweet, sugary, sweet. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun showing uh, new birders their first yellow warbler and teaching them uh, the yellow warbler song. Um, this is a real challenge uh, for all, as many of you know, we're PSO members, teaching new birders uh, how birds, what birds songs are uh, identifiable. And this is one of the easiest birds to teach that. The chestnut sided warbler is fairly common on the mountain. Uh, they're not only found in blueberry thickets, but also those new timbered areas. Uh, it's the only bird I like to use the uh, little uh, ca caveat that the chestnut sided warbler is the only bird named after Pennsylvania. Its scientific name is Dendroic, or oh, used to be Dendroic, but now Cetophaga pennsylvanica. So we're the Audubon never actually saw, uh, but it's fairly, it's very common on North Mountain, particularly in young, young forests. Prairie warblers have moved on the mountain in the last, last 30 or 40 years. Skip Cooter and I would not have been able to show you a prairie warbler quite easily 40 years ago, but now they're pretty common and they've moved up slope and in freshly timbered areas, especially where there's some young pine trees. Uh, they're not just strictly uh, an early successional forest bird, but they particularly like uh, where there's some regenerating pines. Common yellowthroats are one of the most abundant birds in the park. They're found not only in blueberry thickets. And this, this bird is sitting and singing in a blueberry bush, uh, but they're also found in lots of wetlands and uh, in the undergrowth of, of forests that have, uh, have a lot of shrubs. 
field sparrows are a fun bird to, to find. Uh, they're not that common in the park. They're found mostly in the blueberry thickets and the, uh, the timbered areas. They'll, they move in, in right away after an area has been timbered. Um, that's not the sort of species you think about that does that, but they do. They really are a bit misnamed. They should also be, they should be called early successional sparrows instead. But uh, it's a fun bird to teach people the song for, and uh, they're double, maybe even triple brooded, so they sing throughout most of the summer. Song sparrows are also abundant in the park, um, and, and uh, they can be found in a variety of habitats, even in freshly tim newly timbered areas. Uh, Eastern towhees are very common, particularly in, in the, the new the blueberry thickets uh, where there's been uh, so, some silviculture and the edge is a force. Uh, and we've shown many people their, their first Eastern towhee and taught them the drink your tea song. Again, this is one of the challenges we have as birders is teaching people, other people, bird vocalizations. And this is a good bird to start with. Red-winged blackbirds are found mostly in the wetlands of, of the park and game lands. Uh, they, they, they descend on the park in early April, claim their territories, but they're gone now. They move out. Uh, so that's an interesting observation of the red-winged blackbirds. You think of them being omnipresent uh, everywhere, but they are not. They, they tend to move right out of the wetlands where they're nesting up on the mountain. American goldfinch are now settling in and nesting. Uh, uh, they're, they're eating knapweed and, and thistle seeds from which, which, with which they build their nests. And it's a great species to talk to people about the relationship between birds and plants because they are so dependent on, on uh, thistle and knapweed seeds uh, to live. We're having a lot of fun leading bird walks. We often don't get many, many people on our walks, but that's okay. We have a lot of, we, it's easy, actually easier to teach people birds when there's only a handful of people along. And most of the people who come in our, uh, our walks are from out of the area. Very few people, about, I would say only a third, a quarter or a third of the people are, are come within, are driving only a half a mile, half an hour or less. So we reach a lot of different kinds of people in our bird walks. Um, we, so we, we do talk a lot about a variety of habitats. Wild turkeys can be found throughout the park, but they're generally in the open areas. Turkey vultures often soar overhead, uh, but they're more often seen in the afternoons. Red-tailed hawks are actually not that common. They're more of an open, open area bird. So we find them mostly near the highways, and in freshly timbered areas or like someplace like the, the meadows. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are amusingly common in the park because they often will zoom along a trail and perch on top of a, of a little tip up. And they'll show us that they actually eat a lot of gnats and flying insects as well as, as nectar. They also will forage in, on flowering plants at the edges of Lake Jean. And some of the people on our bird walks have seen this themselves when they're paddling around the lake uh, in their kayak. Hummingbirds will zoom by them and they're foraging on the various flowers uh, at the edge of the lake. But they, uh, they're, they're fairly common through the park more at the edge. Eastern Phoebes are very hardy, as you know, and they start, they appear in the park, even at Ricketts Glen, uh, late March, even when there's a little snow on the ground. And they nest not only on buildings and bridges that you know about, but they also nest on cliffs, along streams, and on tip-ups. Blue jays are found mostly at the edges, but also inside the park. They mostly feed on insects, uh, particularly caterpillars in the summer. And right now they're, for, they're, they're running around the park in little gangs, families, and we've been watching the adults teach the young how to do a red-shouldered hawk call in our bird walks. Common ravens are the big black bird of the park. They're, they're widespread in the park. They've been there in, the, in Ricketts Glen and World's End. Even 40, 50 years ago, you could find ravens in the park. Uh, and and uh, now they, there are a few, a few territories, a few pairs in the park. 
and they will often show up in gangs, small gangs, as you see in the lower right hand corner. They're young ravens looking for trouble and getting into mischief. There's also American crows in a park and in migration, you can observe a fish, fish crow occasionally flying over Lake Jean on the way north. Great catbirds are found throughout the park, mostly in the edges. They are uh, a good bird to associate with different kinds of uh, native fruiting and uh, shrubs and, and vines. Here's one eating pokeberry. And here's, here's another one eating the, the fruits of mountain ash or, or, or American rowan. And so it's an opportunity to show people not only what a great cat bird is and what a wonderful bird it is, but also the relationship between birds and uh, the wild plants of the park. I like to rename the American robin, the great American forest thrush because uh, robins are not only found on lawns and near the park, uh, parking lots of the park, but also deep in the forest. You can walk two miles from any parking lot and the bird popping in front of you on the trail could be an American robin that's nesting deep in the woods. Uh, they have a wonderful song and we've taught a lot, shown a lot of people robin nests for the first time. Cedar waxwings are very elegant birds and now they're really moving into places like Ricketts Glen. They're eating cherries and other fruit and also foraging for insects from the same places. In the park, they eat a lot of service berries, blueberries and elderberries and other wild fruit. Uh, a little deviation again, black bears are fairly widespread on North Mountain, particularly in the park. Uh, They're they notorious for raiding campsites and uh, you have to watch what you're doing when you're camping out at Ricketts Glen. You could have a black bear near you at any time. Uh, you also can encounter cubs as I have there along the trail. Bobcats are also found on North Mountain. Here's one I found uh, ran into a game land 57. It's a wildcat and they're, they're found throughout the park, uh, but you just rarely hear or see them. There's also coyotes. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a, a wild coyote picture, but coyotes are downright abundant. And you'll feel, you'll, you can show a lot of people coyote scat when you take a bird walk in the park. White-tailed deer are common, only too abundant in the area. Uh, you can hunt deer in most of the park. There's a small, uh, an area that's most, most heavily used around Lake Jean and the Falls Trail are close to deer hunting. But because there is hunting in the park, deer hunting in the park, the forest is in fairly good condition and we don't have uh, the browse lines that you see in many other places. Uh, a lot of people ask about timber rattlesnakes. So I felt obliged to show you a timber rattlesnake picture. Uh, this venomous reptile is, uh, is pretty widespread on North Mountain, but uh, you don't run into them very much. Uh, and, and you're more likely to run into them in the game lands north of the park than in the park. And for the most part, they're, they're found in the Bowman's Creek and uh, Mahoopany Creek watersheds. They can vary greatly in color from uh, almost a bright yellow to a black, a very dark black. Uh, and they're very, uh, very shy and avoid people. And uh, even when I've come close to rattlesnakes, they've been reluctant even to rattle. So uh, I've not really had any trouble with rattlesnakes. I, I do just keep my distance and uh, give, give them a little respect and we, do, we get along just fine. Forest covers most of the park and rest of, Mount, of, Mount, of North Mountain is home to most of the birds. This is the habitat that's home to most of the birds in the park. Uh, our state bird rough grouse has declined greatly, mostly because of West Nile virus. And some of the game lands adjacent to the park are being managed on this account. So if you see a lot of cuttings, a lot of that's with rough grouse in mind. Um, I've seen some broods back in the woods and uh, there are some areas where they're, they're still, they still live in, on North Mountain. So they're much less common than they used to be. Broad-winged hawks are probably the most, uh, most common, widely distributed hawk in, uh, around. And uh, you can often hear their, their high-pitched scream as you walk any trail. Red-shouldered hawks also are found throughout the park, particularly near water. Uh, they're even found in the lower elevations 
near Route 487. Uh, blue Jays often imitate uh, red-shouldered hawks, but sometimes you hear both the red-shouldered and then the Blue Jays imitating the red-shouldered. The most common raptor in the park is probably the barred owl. Um, and they're found throughout, basically on every single trail. Uh, they even called during the daylight, uh, especially on a, on a cloudy day. And I've heard them doing their, their caterwauling uh, at various times of the day, and much less at night. And this is the owl most people hear when they're camping out or staying in a cabin in the park. Unfortunately, I have to report that this particular owl was hit by a car uh, only about two weeks after I took this photograph. And cars are, are very much uh, a hazard to any uh, low-flying raptor, including the beautiful barred owl. Eastern whippoorwills are found mostly on top of the mountain in the young forest, uh, and uh, particularly near the village of Ricketts. And, but back in the game lands, they're fairly common. You just have to get out there in a moonlight night, moonlit night to find to find them. Downy woodpeckers are uh, found everywhere, and uh, it's one of the most bird, birds you're most likely to see. But they're actually not as common as the larger hairy woodpecker, which is uh, uh, widespread throughout the park. And it's probably not as common as the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which may be the most common woodpecker in the park that not only is very common but it's greatly increased in the last 50 years where it used to be found only on top of the mountain now you can find it quite quite rare, regularly uh, along uh, the lower elevations red-bellied woodpecker another species that's in, increased in the park uh, used to be a, a pretty rare species found only in more lowland forest now it's found very regularly in the lower uh, parts of the Glens Natural Area, but also in the, in the camping areas and around Lake Jean. Flickers are found mostly in the more open and the edgy areas. Pilewood, pilewood woodpeckers are found throughout the park, but you're not, not less likely to see them because they're very, rather shy and you're more likely to hear them. Eastern wood pea is peewee's perhaps the most common uh, flycatcher in the park. And we have lots of fun uh, along our bird walks trying to find peewee nests. Uh, there, we've found them in the Glens Natural Area several times. These species are, are unusual for uh, neotropical migrants in that they are double brooded and will use the same nest for their second, for their second brood as for the first. And we've actually observed that on our bird walks. Least flycatchers give us a thrill now and then. They're, I think they've actually declined in the park in the last few years, in the last 10 or 20 years. But uh, there was one pair that was right by the visitors area. So we uh, showed several people the first least flycatcher again this year. Red-eyed vireos are by far the most abundant bird of, of the of Ricketts Glen State Park and the two adjacent game lands. They're incessantly singing. Now they're not singing quite as much now as they were a few weeks ago, but they're delightfully common. And one of the fun things to do is to show people their first red Iberia. Uh, as you know, they're not that easy to see because they're usually in the treetops and they blend in so well with the vegetation. Black capped chickadees are found throughout the park. This is a species that actually has declined a great deal. It's a victim of West Nile virus. And I've been seeing a bit of a uh, resurgence of this species to last year or so, uh, with many broods traveling around the park now. But this is this used to be much more common or locally abundant in the old growth forest, and West Nile virus has taken its toll on, on the chickadee. Tough to tin mouse are found mostly in the lower elevations and also near, near water at the higher elevations. White-breasted nuthatches are common throughout the park, everywhere where there's big trees. Carolina wrens are found mostly in the, almost exclusively in the lower elevations of the park, but now they're quite regular. This is one of the other changes in bird populations that we've observed the last 50 years in around North Mountain. They now regularly winter at the lower part of Ricketts Glen, where before that was, uh, you would rarely find one. 
So I've had the last couple of years, not this year, but previous two or three years, I've had them with territories overlapping with winter wren, and I've never observed that before. So they're easily found along the Evergreen Trail, along Trip Road, and uh, in the lower part of, uh, of the Bulldozer Road. Wood thrush, as you all know, is one of the most popular uh, songbirds in the state. It's found in rich bottomland forest of the Glens Natural Area, uh, the Evergreen Trail across the, the road from that. And occasionally you can find there's a little locations on the top of the park, the higher elevations, usually near water, where they can be found. Uh, they, I believe that they're double brooded in the park and it'd be fun to find out uh, where ours go. They probably go to Honduras or in Nicaragua or most Pennsylvania with thrushes spend the winter. Viries have increased in the park because of a lot of regeneration that's occurred. Um, and they can be found in many of the different trails. Uh, they're singing less now, but this is one of the most commonly heard birds in the park, especially along the Evergreen Trail and the Grand View Trail. Oven birds are perhaps the second most abundant bird found in the park. They're, they're, they can be heard and seen along basically every trail in the park. Nashville warblers are uh, inhabit sort of semi-open areas, old timbered areas, uh, wetlands, blueberry thickets. Uh, they're much more common than people think, mostly off-road. Black and white warblers are lots of fun, and we get them along on most of our bird walks that are in the woods. And uh, it's a fun song for to teach new, new birders. American red stars are found primarily in the deciduous, young deciduous forest, mostly in the oak forest, but also in mixed forest. They're also found in, uh, in some of the wetland, have forested wetlands. Black-throated green warbler is one of the most common birds in the park. In some places you can hear two or maybe three males singing from at one location. Um, I believe though that this species has declined for unknown reasons. And uh, there are not as many black throated greens uh, on North Mountain as there were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun, and that's another one of those fun birds to teach the beginners. And many, we've shown many people their first black throated green warbler at the park. Uh, I've deliberately showing you a cerulean warbler from the bottom up because they're, they sing mostly higher up in the trees. There is a small population of cerulean warblers in Ricketts Glen State Park, and they are associated with tall uh, oak and maple trees. This species is actually uh, increasing along the Allegheny Front, and there's some uh, clusters of, of uh, Surian warblers at various points along the Allegheny Front, and north, even north of Ricketts Glen, northeast of Ricketts Glen, north of Knoxon, there's even some populations. So the trick is to learn its song, which is faster than that of the black through green blue warbler, which is actually more common in the park. Hooded warblers are another, another species that increased in the park. They are found, they live in extensive forest with a, with a good understory uh, and are easy to find along the lower bulldozer, the evergreen and beaver dam and, and Grand View trails. They're even found at 2000 feet at some locations where there's a heavy understory a lot of blackberry thickets. And this is particularly along the, uh, the lower part of the Beaver Dam Trail. This is a change in bird populations over the last 40 years. But the warblers are expanding up the mountain and uh, seem to be uh, doing well where there's regenerating forest. One of the best birds to show a newbie is the Scarlet Tanger. They're just spectacular birds and they're found throughout the park in, in mature forest along many trails. Uh, here, this is a, a bird that's in a, an oak tree, but uh, uh, and I, I find them in all kinds of forests in the park, but they seem to be more common in mature oaks. Rose-breasted grosbeaks are not as common as scarlet tangers, but can be found along several different, several different places uh, in the park, particularly the old bulldozer trail. Baltimore Orioles are not that common in the park, but uh, 
they, they like really tall trees, but they actually like more uh, forest edge than deep forest. So we get to show them, uh, them occasionally on our bird walks and they often respond to uh, caterpillar outbreaks. Uh, an animal that's fun to observe in the park and the local game lands is the porcupine. They're fairly common throughout the park. Many people walk right by them when they walk on trails. They'll just sit still and let you walk by. Unfortunately, a lot get hit by vehicles along the highways. One of the great highlights of the park and, and the adjacent game lands is the conifer forest. And the conifers that comprise this forest are mostly Eastern hemlock, that's the dominant species, but we also have some scattered groves of Eastern white pine and red spruce. In the bogs, we have some Eastern tamarack and black spruce. As you, many of you know, I led a, an effort to survey solid owls uh, throughout the state. I just want to report that solid owls are fairly common on top of the mountain at Ricketts Glen. And some of the routes I did for that survey in 2000, 2001 are either touched the park or very close to the park. And I found several uh, solid owls on those routes. Um, uh, you just need to be out there at night and uh, to listen for them, they sing a lot more in March and April and May than later in the season, but I've even heard them tooting along uh, in July and August, uh, especially when the moon's out. A great uh, bird to show people is the blue-headed vireo. Uh, they're absolutely charming birds as well as being attractive with that bluish head and those spectacles. And they're fun because they, uh, they'll follow you around a little bit. They're very curious birds. And so this is one of the birds we've enjoyed showing beginners. Uh, and they're very easy to find in the hemlocks along most of the trails, particularly the Glen's natural area, but basically along any trail with hemlocks. And we've even found a, a, a nest or two on our bird walks. Here's a blue-headed vireo nest, uh, very close to Adams Falls, uh, in the Glens Natural Area. It's one of, the one of our first bird walks. They have a beautifully woven nest. Red-breasted nuthatches are common in the park. Uh, they're found mostly uh, in big hemlocks and also in red spruce stands. They really benefit when they're, they really uh, react to a big uh, hemlock or spruce cone crops. And then they'll stay the next spring to, to nest if there's a big cone crop. Um, they're, this varies from year to year, but they're found uh, throughout the park on any year. And it's just in some years they're more abundant than others. Brown creepers are also found in the park, mostly in the old growth forest, but basically any forest in the park. This is another species that's declined due to West Nile virus. So I do not find as many as I did years ago, but uh, you can find them and they have an absolutely beautiful song uh, that uh, is one of the prettiest songs in the woods of Pennsylvania. And we're delighted if we can pick, point that out to uh, some of the birds on our bird walks. Uh, perhaps the most iconic bird of the park is the winter wren. They're found uh, on many of the trails. They arrive really early. They live true to their name. I don't think they, they migrate far because <laughs> they show up even the last week of March, a little snow on the ground. So winter wrens will show up and start singing uh, their wild exuberant babbling song along most of the trails of the park, particularly the lower part of the park, they, they arrive early. And one of our great thrills is to, to get winter wrens on our bird walks. Uh, they, they nest in these uh, root balls and under logs. Uh, so they're found in all those kinds of areas where there's older forest. Hermit thrush is perhaps the most common thrush in the park. They, uh, particularly the higher elevations that are most highly associated with hemlocks or spruce forest. As you know, they have uh, a beautiful song. We also like to teach people their call notes, that chup call, that whiny twang. And uh, these are, you're much more likely to hear those calls along the trail than their song. But this is found mostly in higher elevations, but you can even hear a hermit thrush along the Evergreen Trail, which is the lowest elevation in the whole park. 
One of the most brilliant and beautiful birds of Pennsylvania is the black green warbler. And they are found throughout the park, particularly in uh, hemlock groves. This particular photo was taken in a red spruce grove of Gamelands 57, uh, but where they're fairly common in the spruce, spruce forest and of uh, the wetlands. I like to make the connections between the breeding, uh, breeding ground and the winter ground on many occasions. And I'd like to, uh, I often use the blackberry and warbler as one of those examples. I took this picture in Panama where it's a wintering bird in the, in the, in the forest. And uh, if we are to have these birds in the future, we not only have to protect their habitat on their breeding ground, but also on a wintering ground, in this case, Central and South America, but with other species at other locations. Magnolia warblers are pretty common in the park, uh, particularly in hemlocks and spruces. They don't need a big mature tree to be in. They're often in the lower, lower parts of hemlocks. And uh, they, it's a tricky bird song to learn. Wee -tee, wee -tee, wee -tee. And it's kind of, it's kind of fast. Uh, so it's often mistaken for other birds. And it's a trick to learn this between, uh, it's sort of a cross between a, a red start and a hooded warbler. But uh, this is a really good bird to teach people. And we have a lot of fun finding magnolia, the misnamed magnolia warbler uh, in, uh, in the park. Black-throated blue warblers are found on many of the trails and even at lower elevations, often where there's a little opening in the forest and, uh, and near, the, uh, near hemlocks, uh, often where there's a blowdown or some other uh, interruption in the forest canopy. Yellow rumped or myrtle warblers uh, are, have, have really increased in, on the mountain in the last 40 years. And they can be found at all kinds of elevations, but mostly associated with hemlocks or other conifers. Dark-eyed junco is among the most common birds in the park all through the year, particularly in the summer. They're a common widespread breeding bird uh, on North Mountain, particularly in the hemlocks. Uh, or where there's a high hemlock component in the forest. They are ground, breed, uh, ground nesters and will also nest in tip-ups. So they're often nesting right along the trail that you're walking on. Purple finches have a beautiful song and they can be found mostly in the edges of the forest in the park and in game lands. They're big time bud eaters. So in the first early spring, they're actually, that's what they're mostly eating. Pine siskins are, are nesting can nest in the area. And I found them uh, uh, high, uh, in the park in the breeding season when, when there's a big hemlock crop. But they often will feed on the, for, on the, the uh, seeds of birches and aspens. A fun, a fun animal to find along the, the trails are red squirrels. And, but these are probably important nest predators. As you know, uh, this is the place where I've been studying boreal forest birds for many years. And here's uh, one picture of Coal Bed Swamp. We have a little bit of boreal forest in Rickus Glen, but more of it's in Game Land 57. And really Rickus Glen is the edge of the, of the state's boreal forest. Uh, and, uh, and it's or actually the continent's boreal forest. Although it's not shown on maps, there is true boreal forest on North Mountain, particularly uh, in the spruce bogs of uh, Game Lands 57. Red spruce is an important component of the Appalachian Mountains boreal forest. It's much more common in West Virginia than it is in Pennsylvania. Uh, and its distribution is shown on the map on the right. Most red spruces are found in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And these populations are distinctive genetically from other red spruce populations. They've been isolated from other red spruces for a long time. One of the species associated with these boreal forests is the Northern goshawk, the ultimate forest raptor has greatly declined. It has nested in the park. And the picture on the left is a photograph I took of an active uh, goshawk nest in Loyal Sox State Forest, but they have greatly declined and are now considered uh, a Pennsylvania endangered species. Uh, they're quite vulnerable to West Nile virus and also perhaps to nest once the species got really low populations or even more vulnerable to nest predators and I believe that uh, 
the loss of prey populations might, might also be a factor with uh, goshawk. Olive-sided flycatcher once, once nested on the mountains, and I believe it could nest there again. Uh, in 1900, Whitmer Stone commented in his publication that they were rather common, scattered intervals in the mountains. This penetrating call was, was heard continually. Uh, it has been rediscovered in West Virginia at Dolly Sods area, so I think there's potential for this species to rediscover Pennsylvania as a breeder. I've been studying yellow belly flycatchers in Pennsylvania for many years. Uh, this is a nest I took a picture of in Sullivan County several years ago. Unfortunately, uh, that population has died out. They have nested, their largest population has been in Dutch Mountain wetlands, mostly cold bed swamp or other swamps nearby. Uh, they can also, they have been found also in hemlock swamps. Uh, here's a sort of a, this is a chart of uh, the just of the timeline for, for different populations I've tracked over the year. I ended this timeline at, in 2015. Unfortunately, I have not heard or seen a breeding yellow belly flycatcher in Pennsylvania for now the second summer. Um, I won't say for sure that it's extirpated, but uh, it seems to have disappeared from uh, locations I have found it for many years. And I, the habitat still looks very good. I just think this is a shrinking population like so many other boreal forest birds. Uh, Swain, uh, Swains and thrushes are also found on the mountain and uh, are, are boreal forest bird. They are found in hemlock groves in the North Mountain, very few in the park. They're more often found in game lands 57. Um, here's a nest of a, of a bird that I found a, uh, a couple of years ago. They are still nesting in some places in game lands 57, but several of the, the populations I found in the past are, have disappeared. Um, and even since 2020, which I took some of these nesting bird pictures, the, I cannot find swains and thrushes at those particular locations. Black pole warbler. Uh, I discovered the black pole warbler population in Pennsylvania, and uh, we put it on the endangered species list uh, in the early 19, uh, after finding them nesting for over 10 years straight. They, are found, they were found primarily in, in boreal forest, uh, bo forested bogs, uh, not only in red spruce, but also even more commonly where black spruce and tamarack were the dominant species, where there's less canopy than where a yellow belly flycatcher nests. Uh, we have found it, they actually seem to have expanded into Pennsylvania, perhaps from the Catskills. Uh, here's a nest to the, on the left-hand side that uh, that we found Eric that's Eric Zawatsky, who acted as my assistant for a few years, working on yellow belly uh, on yellow belly flock catchers and black pole warblers, and he's standing next to a black pole warbler nest in a remote swamp in Game Lands 57 in Wyoming County. Took that picture a few years ago. Unfortunately, both these populations are. Are, are, have declined greatly the last five, 10 years. And I'm having a hard time finding uh, any yellow belly flat catchers and black pole warblers have declined where I once found them fairly easily. Other boreal forest birds of the area are northern water thrush. Uh, they're found mostly in the bogs and pond edges. Canada warblers can be fairly common, not only in, in blueberry swamps, but uh, in freshly cut, some freshly cut areas, but mostly in the swampy areas with, with a dense understory. Waythroat sparrows are not only a common uh, wintering bird in Pennsylvania, they're locally found as breeding species on North Mountain in the Poconos. And uh, we've, we've shown many people uh, waythroat sparrows in the hayfields and around Splash Dam Pond where they nest. We occasionally observe red cross bills, sometimes in flight. Uh, sometimes perch, they have nested on Dutch Mountain uh, in the past, uh, and I suspect they might nest again. I keep looking for them. I heard one seeing just a few days ago on, on Game Lands 57. They react well to big outbreaks of different conifers, particularly uh, spruce and hemlock and pine. Uh, just to kind of go over what we've done with 
with our various studies, I have published the yellow belly flycatcher birds of North America now, it's known as birds of the world. And I've published other, uh, other literature on uh, Pennsylvania spruce forest birds. We've had some successes with our project. We're, first of all, we're getting great support from the staff. Rhiannon and Summer, the EES, the Environmental Education uh, Specialist there, the naturalist has been a terrific partner, uh, does a wonderful job. We've got lots of uh, eBird reports. We collect a lot of bird photographs. Most of the photos you've seen on this presentation are my own. Uh, we have a lot of uh, interaction with other birders, but there are some challenges. First of all, even though Ricus Glen and North Mountain are fairly important for birds, uh, very few birders or naturalists go there. Um, we don't. We occasionally get visited by bird clubs from uh, from bigger from the metropolitan areas, but local birders rarely go to Ricketts Glen, and and uh, uh, we don't get that much attendance by local Auduboners either. Um, and it's a difficult access in some season, particularly winter. Uh, we have, as like anywhere else in the state, we've got lots of issues with eBird data entry and there's lots of false reports entered for Ricketts Glen for a variety of reasons. Uh, and we have, we still, we've got really good coverage, but we still have poor coverage for sort of the usual, um, the usual kind of species that are difficult to monitor. The night and crepuscular birds uh, don't have enough data for the passage migrants, it's actually a much more better place for breeding birds uh, and during the cool water periods. And we don't have much data on, on passage waterfowl or shorebirds. Uh, we would like to see more studies of, of the rare boreal forest species in this state, throughout the state. Uh, and some people are following uh, my lead on that. And I'm glad to hear of reports. I'm particularly enthusiastic about the research done by David Yaney, who's done a wonderful job uh, with the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program with this peatland bird surveys and others. Uh, we really need uh, a network of off-road point counts to really accommodate, uh, understand what's going on with our northern forest birds, particularly our boreal birds. You just not pick up a lot of these species on a, a regular standard BBS route. We like to get more people engaged because this is where the birds are up in these big forests. And it's, it's tricky to get people to travel that far and be engaged with doing these surveys. Um, anyway, we, we like to do more and uh, the challenges are that these places are distant and, and uh, there's not many birders or active naturalists in the immediate area. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. I'd like to give a special thanks to all the people who have supported this kind of research and a big hats off to the uh, naturalist at Ricketts Glen State Park, Rhiannon Summers, who's been an absolutely wonderful partner uh, in educating people about birds. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know, I guess we can take any questions uh, that people may have. I'm not sure how much time we have. Yeah, we definitely can take some questions. We have a couple of people who posed questions in the Q&A section about uh, tip-ups. You described tip-ups a couple times talking about nests. Mm -hmm. oh, so they want um, to know what that was. Okay, sorry. You know, I, I almost included a picture of a tip. Basically where, when a tree blows down and, um, uh, and you get the roots sticking up in the air. And uh, remind me to, to add that as a slide. Uh, <laughs> and so a lot of foresters uh, or ecologists would call that a tip-up. And uh, one of the benefits of a tip-up, you all have uh, that root, uh, exposed roots, uh, and also uh, you have a, like a little bowl, like a little pond. So salamanders and frogs often will nest in those little, that little pond underneath there, and it attracts a lot of flying insects, which in turn attracts birds. Sorry for not explaining that a little better. Does that help? That did, Doug, absolutely. Um, I've always known them as root balls, um, but so I learned something tonight, a new term for, for what okay. I call root balls for many, many years, tip up. I, <laughs> right, this, yeah, same thing, and I've called the root balls too. All right, very good. I think when Dallas 
Excellent, Doug. Uh, very informative. Um, we have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions uh, for Doug about um, Ricketts Glen or his surrounding area or his work. Doug, did you say that it's old growth forest at Ricketts Glen, or is it a mix of old growth forest and um, uh, logged, you know, that it has been logged now, second growth forest? Yeah, I apologize for not being clear about that. Um, uh, the, the old growth forest is in the Glens Natural Area, which is uh, what the Falls Trail sort of uh, goes through, what people know well about. Um, however, uh, that's only a, a small sliver of the park. Um, and uh, if I could go back, oh, I can do this. I apologize for the Going back so far. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and that's where the, and where exactly, I don't know if we know where exactly old growth forest ends, begins and ends in a park. So as you see, um, looking at this map, the old growth forest is where that, you see that square in the middle where they have, uh, can, can you follow, it's in, it's in this area here what's called the Glens Natural Area. Uh, however, a lot of the, the forest that's at the edge of that is pretty old. Uh, and some of this was cut very early when it was cut, especially up around the hayfield. So a lot of those trees there are 120, 140 years old, perhaps. So we have a lot of old growth. The other, um, the other aspect of this is that not only do you have old growth forest, it's not just old, but it's mixed aged. Almost all, all old growth forest, you have, you'll have one tree that's like two or three or 400 years old, and the tree right next to it might be 20 years old, and the tree next to that might be 50 years old. And that's one of the benefits of these kinds of forests, because that makes it much more interesting to birds and other kinds of wildlife, because there's a mix of different vegetation types and substrates because of that. And even in the places that aren't truly old growth, uh, Rickus Glen tends to have that kind of age distribution of vegetative structure. Thanks, Doug. That's really interesting. Right. Well, I should have explained that. It gives me, you're giving me ideas for more explanatory slides. <laughs> right. A few more questions came in, Doug. Um, sure. went from Mike, uh, did, did evening grow speaks use to nest in that area at one time? Do you know anything about evening oh. grow speaks nesting there? Uh, yes, I do. I saw them. Uh, evening grow speaks, that's an interesting story. Um, evening grow speaks nested, uh, about 1983 or four. Is that right? No, or 93 or four. Sorry, showing my age. Uh, here it is. It's feature, it was featured in Pennsylvania Birds. And it was 1990, 1994. And, and they nested, interestingly enough, in reaction to an elm spanworm breakout. So although most of you think of evening gross peaks as your great scourge of uh, sunflower seeds, during uh, they eat a lot of small caterpillars during the breeding season, during the summer. So they're reacting to a huge uh, outbreak of uh, elm spanworm on North Mountain at that time that covered several uh, miles, several square miles. And they nested in an apple tree right in Skip Conant's backyard by Schmidt Henner Lake, very close to the, barely in Wyoming County, very close to the Sullivan County line. But the other story is that they also were nesting at other locations along uh, dirt roads. I had them flying over Cold Bed Swamp, uh, adults with young in July. And, and they also, I saw uh, family groups along Windy Valley Road, a couple miles from where Skip was. And they nested probably along uh, near Dushore. They were not nesting particularly in the deep boreal forest they were even nesting uh, in 
in backs of people's houses, uh, wherever, and they're just nesting like you would have a purple finch nest, uh, not, not a, a strange location. Uh, so yes, they have, they have nested and it was in response to a, a caterpillar, a huge caterpillar outbreak. So you should, you should be looking for that again. Pardon? Yes, that was great, thank you. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> I saw <laughs> you were witnessing I, it. One of the things I did is that I was working professionally at the time and see, I, I was very pleased because this was a wonderful thing for me. There's a, uh, an experienced clinical amateur birder and uh, Skip Conant was eager to, to, to work on this. So I backed off and let Skip report it. So he wrote it up for Pennsylvania birds and and he, you know, uh, he, he sort of gave the show on the evening growth speaks. Uh, there's some other questions here. Are fracking pads and roads influence bird movements and activity? Well, that that's a question really for Margaret Birmingham, who unfortunately just, well, unfortunate for us, just retired from Penn State University and was studying uh, fracking. And I think one of the things that I've not actually observed personally, I've not studied fracking effects on birds. But I think basically when you go in and put in a big pad and clear the forest, you're just eliminating forest areas. And those areas tend to be very busy. So what, it, what tends to happen is that you get birds that are more attracted to disturbed areas. So you get field sparrows and chipping sparrows and those sorts of brown-headed cowbirds. And you get fewer birds that are associated with, uh, with the deep forest. That's what happens when you get with fracking. Uh, well, I've not actually studied that specifically, but that's a big issue in Bradford uh, County and Northern Sullivan County, uh, where there, these pads are, are pretty common. Day and time for the bird walks, you will be leaving at Ricketts in the months ahead. Um, we, 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 we published that uh, Ricketts Glen State Park has this on their, their activities page and you can readily find that by looking up Ricketts Glen State Park's DCNR page. I also published those on the Ricketts Glen, the Facebook page on you know, birds and wildlife of Ricketts Glen State Park. Um, I know we're having a bird walk this Thursday and we're having two in early August. Uh, thanks, thanks to uh, all these. Uh, I'm, I'm getting out of line here. Rob and Carol Bly, great. To, well, th well, thank you very much, Rob and Carol, for your comments. Uh, as I'm always glad to see Rob and Carol. Carol Winslow asked another really good question. Thanks for all these questions. Yes, I do think that Swainson's thrushes or all of back thrushes are declining on North Mountain. And the reason I didn't go into all this because my presentation isn't specifically on boreal forest birds, but I've been looking at Swainson's thrushes on North Mountain since 1983 uh, or four, when I first discovered a population of Swainson's thrush by accident in Gamelands 13 along Glass Creek Pond. And the way I found it is my wife and I were blueberry picking at a Glass Creek Pond, then we took a walk through the woods and I heard Swainson's thrushes singing. And then I saw them feeding young blueberries along the trail, uh, along Glass Creek. And I've not seen a, a Swainson's thrush and I've had as many as eight, six or 10 singing male Swainson's thrushes there in the past. And I have not had a Swainson's thrush there in well, at least six or seven years, something like that. I've also had other, there are these clusters of Swainson's thrushes on the mountain. Uh, I should have explained that to begin with. And I've had them along different trails named or unnamed in Ricketts Glen State Park. Uh, one near North Bowman Creek, near Mountain Springs Lake. And I was just told um, uh, by some people at Eagles Mirror that Skip Conant used to take them every year and show them those Swainson's thrushes and said, well, I know exactly where he took you. And unfortunately they're not there anymore. Uh, and these habitats look just the same as they did then. Uh, I have several other locations that go just by point by point, and I find that these clusters of Swainson's thrushes 
have just winked out. I can find Swainson's Rush as I'm hoping to find, I'll be up in Swainson's Rush territory on Wednesday morning. I'm only gonna find at most four territories where in the past I would have found several others. Yes, yeah, so they are, so beware. Uh, we may be seeing an, a, a, a slow retraction of this species, even in inappropriate habitat. It's a little scary to me. I thought in retirement, I was gonna be studying yellow belly flat catchers, black pole warblers and Swainson's thrushes and with detailed mapping of their territories and finding pictures of their, getting pictures of their young. And now I can't find the darn things. Fairfax, can you talk about the hemlock declines due to woolly adelgid and is that a steady decline or is there some hope? I think there's some hope. Uh, I think the, the hemlock's doing fairly well in the higher elevations. There is some mortality in the lower elevations and whatever declines there are, and some of these royal forest birds are, uh, despite the fact that the hemlocks seem to be doing, for the most part, okay, there is mortality, but it's not outrageous. It's not really high. It's not along the upper part of the Delaware. It's not like the upper part of the Delaware. They've lost hundreds of acres of hemlock forest. Um, it's, it's just hard to say why some of these species are declining. And I almost didn't, there are some things I almost did with this program that I did not do because I think it's only too long as it is. But one would be looking at the full cycle life history of these species. And that you have to think about their wintering ground and their migration through the whole year. All of these species, it's with the very few exceptions, are migratory. And I believe that one of the issues is that they're losing quality habitat on their wintering ground. And, and even some of that might be due to global climate change. And also global climate change is trumps up uh, some of the other issues that they're having. Uh, so we're seeing retractions of some species uh, where in the heart of their, their green round range, they might be doing okay, but when the species declines, they often seem to shrink from the edges of their breeding range, even if the habitat's good on the green, at the edge. How can I get a schedule of your bird walks? Um, we, we published, a look at the, the website or a Facebook page of Rickus Glen State Park, uh, and they have an events calendar. In fact, that's how many people learn of the, uh, the bird walks and other events. Right? If you're on Facebook, uh, I know some people resist that, but it's, and if you you can you can kind of lurk on Facebook without showing too much of yourself. It's a very handy way to show people things, and that's why a lot of us do that. In fact, in my opinion, most of these small rural bird clubs and Audubon clubs wouldn't exist without Facebook. I think it brings people together, and makes it easy to share your experiences and your photographs. Thank you very much for the excellent questions. I appreciate it. And if anyone, a lot of you probably know my email address. If you have other questions you might have for me or my Facebook page, feel free to send them my way. Doug and I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Julia. I'm gonna ask the same thing, Doug. It's okay if we put your, your email address in the chat. Oh yes, that's fine. I may not answer right away. <laughs> I'm out in the woods a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I also shared a link to Ricketts Glen State Park's counter of events that you could find online too, which right. uh, um, you would find Doug's walks uh, advertised on right. there. And I'm looking, and I'll share your page as well um, on your Facebook or your Facebook page. And I'm open to suggestions to how other other ways to share this information. I think we're reaching a lot of people, but you know, there's always more things to do. Um, and I've given this presentation a few times, and I'd be interested in comments about the quality and the, and the, uh, the subject matter of my presentation. And one of the reasons I by the way, I talk about a lot of fairly common species is that 
uh, over half those people come on our bird walks are, are beginners. And so it's news to them that red-eyed vireos are common in, are in, in the forest and what they look like. And uh, it's a thrill to show a lot of people even their first red-eyed vireos, lots of fun. So don't get too, too jaundiced about <laughs> being a hotshot birder and adding more birds to your list. Uh, we have a long road to hoe with getting people interested in birds and their environment. And uh, it, the more people we, we involve, the better. I'm glad you're kind of at the tip of that spear, Doug. You're, I know you do a lot there at Ricketts Glen. And um, so, and I know Rhiannon is uh, very happy to have you as I'm part of her team there. Well, she's a great partner. I, uh, she is. She's a person who's eager to learn new things, and that's hard to find. And she's very cooperative, and uh, she steps right in. And one of my personal achievements is that four years ago, Rhiannon didn't know anything about birds. Now she can lead a bird walk and do it quite well. Awesome. Very good. Well, any more questions from anyone? We covered them all. Like I said in the chat, we listed the uh, counter events for Ricketts Glen State Park where you can find Doug's bird walks when they're advertised. Uh, his email is on there as well and a link to his Facebook page that he uh, runs, the Birds and Wildlife of Ricketts Glen State Park. All right. Yeah, and please, <laughs> if you do visit the park, please, please fill out allowed an eBird report and also uh, if you take some pictures, share with them on our Facebook page. I'm glad to see other people's comments and uh, observations. We'd love to learn more about the butterflies and dragonflies and reptiles and amphibians in the park too. I'll have to get up with the Rhiannon. Maybe we could do some type of coordinative effort there, a little bio blitz there. <laughs> awesome. Uh, John, you're not seeing the email address. Oh, I, I see. Julia is, is posted to host and panelists. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> thanks yeah. for coming on that. Got it. I'll copy and paste it. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> no questions about ivory billed woodpeckers. Oh. <laughs> that going to say that for another talk, and I think okay. it, that's something. <laughs> We, that would take a whole nother hour for us to, to discuss. Right. Well, I have my perspectives. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I just, just, I will add something here is that, again, I'm not one for talking about myself, actually, believe it or not. But um, if it was not for my research, there'd be no yellow belly flycatcher or black pole warbler nesting records in the state. Zero. None despite the fact that Pennsylvania has high, one of the highest birding populations anywhere. So my, my note on the ivory bill woodpecker question, keep an open mind. Birders are not covering everywhere. I know that from personal experience. So you're saying they're at Ricketts Glen State Park? Why <laughs> you think they're pileated? Look at where their feet are, are, Tony. Look at where their feet are. Ricketts Glen. Yes. <laughs> oh, cool. I'm yeah. looking. Yes. <laughs> That's all we can do, right, is look. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, Doug, thank you so much for uh, sharing your vast experience Bye. and and knowledge with, with us um, in, in our, the group that we gathered here tonight. So thank you so much. It was definitely a pleasure to well, thank hear you. from you and learn from you. And, uh, and, and a, nod, a nod to good old Rob Bly there, who was my partner for studying birds and Rick and Gamelands 57 as part of the, uh, the important bird area project there with Pennsylvania Audubon. He, did, he was awesome. He did a great job and glad to hear from him. Good. Thanks to all of you. Yes, thank you.